All right, I think we will uh, get our events started. And uh, probably on a Friday morning, watch people uh, stream in. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted to say that we're going to be welcomed today by our fantastic dean here at Stanford Law School, Liz McGill, who is in her second year as dean. We're so thrilled to have her. And she's been an unstinting supporter of uh, this conference um, and of robust intellectual exchange at the law school. So I'm delighted that she's here to welcome you. Uh, well, I'm, I'm delighted that you all are here. Uh, this is the official welcome to Stanford and Stanford Law School. I do have a principle as dean, which is that anything Jane and Gary want to do, I am in favor of, uh, of that. So uh, <laughs> you have to have some rules of thumb as dean, and, and that's certainly one of them. Uh, I do think I was looking over the, uh, the schedule for the next two days. My, my greatest regret is that I won't get to stay the entire time. But I do think at the conference we're doing two things that we think we do pretty well at Stanford. Uh, at the law school and the university. One is, you'll, you, I'm sure you notice this conference is quite interdisciplinary. Uh, people come from sociology, psychology, law, uh, all sorts of different fields. Uh, that is, of course, the way to study social, political, legal change. Uh, it doesn't come in one box or another. There's no one perspective in thinking about such things. Uh, and I think this, we like to think we do this well at Stanford within the law school and, and more broadly. And the conference reflects that, which is, which is terrific. Another thing we're pretty proud of is the connection between the practice of legal, social, political change and the study of legal, social, and political change. Uh, we have uh, an extraordinary clinical program that Juliet Brody runs. And the connection between uh, folks who are working in legal practice and learning how to be great lawyers in our clinical program, and then the reflection on that practice and the study of that practice is something we, is I think, a hallmark of what we're trying to do at Stanford. So it's, uh, again, that's obvious in the conference as well. We have people who are uh, practicing uh, and people who are studying the practice, which I think is, again, a great way to study and think about and reflect upon change or movements. Uh, and that's what we try to do. So I'm really happy you're here. I wish I could stay all of uh, both days, but I won't be able to do that. I do want to recognize Gary and Jane. Uh, any of you who have put on a conference know that uh, there are about 27,000 things that you have to uh, think about and decide. Many of them happen in the last 10 days before uh, the conference is occurring. And uh, Gary and Jane have done yeoman's work, mostly in keeping all of it off my desk, which is <laughs> <laughs> which probably drove them crazy, but uh, uh, is great for all of us. So thanks for being here. I can stay a little while, but let's, let's get on with it. Thanks for coming. And um, so I'm going to kick things off and try to kind of set the table for the really rich array of uh, panels that we have um, coming up. Uh, we have an absolutely wonderful lineup of speakers. We're so thrilled to have you all here. We have a couple more uh, coming in during the day today, and we're really eager to hear your perspectives. Um, I want to take a minute, too, to, to thank our donors, because I was talking to a couple of you this morning. It's very unusual to be on a campus where you have this kind of support for a conference like this. So this conference has been supported by the Office of the Provost, the Law School, the School of Humanities and Sciences, the Stanford Center for American Democracy, the Office of the Vice Provost for Graduate Education, the Department of Political Science, Inspires, Clayman Institute for Gender Research, Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, and the Program in Feminist, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. So we really have had a, an amazing response from all over campus. And I have to thank that human ball of energy named Gary Segura, who did an absolutely amazing job raising money all over campus for this conference and has been a really inspired and creative partner in planning it. So uh, that made my, my, my job a lot easier. Um, OK. So in terms of trying to set the table for what's to come, um, I want to take a moment to try to take stock of where the marriage debate has come in the last 20 years. And I say 20 years because it's conventional to date the modern marriage movement to the Hawaii Supreme Court decision in the Bear case in 1993, 
which was something like a judicial shot heard around the world, at a time when the organized gay rights movement not only was not pressing for marriage equality, but thought, I think with good reason and good evidence, that it was premature to litigate the case in the early 1990s. That doesn't mean, in retrospect, it was a bad decision, but it was there was a basis for worrying about what might uh, happen before the ground had been prepared, uh, as it were. So the case, the case was, in fact, uh, brought by a private litigator. But it is worth remembering, as we begin, that marriage equality cases were actually filed less than a year after the Stonewall Uprising. These early challenges uh, in Minnesota, in Washington, in Kentucky, not only lost and lost big, um, but in more than one of these cases, the plaintiff who filed the lawsuit and sought to get a marriage license then had a job offer uh, withdrawn, tried to litigate that without success. So it was a very different time. Um, when I first taught sexual orientation in the law as a baby law professor in the early 1990s, there was no uh, published casebook in existence. Uh, there were, uh, the first time I taught it, I used uh, Bill Rubenstein's uh, Xerox materials. Bill Rubenstein uh, now teaches at Harvard. He doesn't work on gay rights issues anymore. He's turned to civil procedure as his new passion. Um, if you can, I don't know if somebody can explain that to me. But, um, but in any event, um, uh, I used Bill's uh, materials the first time. And then the second time, his materials came out as a book called Lesbians, Gay Men, and the Law. We didn't have the B and the T, I guess, yet in the, in the, in the phrase. And it wasn't really a, a real case book. You know, it was paperback, and it was, it was published by a funky press called The New Press. Um, and I looked back on it last night to remember what was available on the subject of marriage when this book was out in 1993. It was a very small little chapter. It had, of course, Loving versus Virginia, Right, the U.S. Supreme Court case on um, uh, anti-miscegenation laws. Um, it had uh, those cases I mentioned, those early cases, uh, Kentucky, uh, Washington, Minnesota. It had, a, it had in a note a little mention of a trial court decision seek, uh, in a case seeking marriage equality in Hawaii that had gone against the plaintiffs. And no sign that was going to become anything big. Um, it was really a, a very different time. Now there are a number of competing case books published by the major uh, law publishers. Um, I've joined Bill on, on his case book. Um, our our uh, speaker for tomorrow, Bill Eskridge, uh, is co-editor of another one. There's a few more out there, so it's kind of much more of a booming uh, area of study and teaching. And the, the, as you might imagine, the chapters on marriage are now hundreds of pages. Uh, hundreds of pages long. Um, there was something else in this book that has become something of a canonical part of at least the legal scholarship and uh, pedagogical uh, approach to sexual orientation in the law. And that was a debate in Outlook magazine in 1989 between uh, two, uh, two leading activists of the gay rights movement, both of whom, I'm sorry to say, are no longer with us. Um, a Paula Edelbrick, who wrote a, uh, uh, an article uh, in the magazine called Since When is, a Ma is Marriage a Path to Liberation? And she was countered. Uh, they both worked for Lambda Legal Defense at the time. She was countered by the director, Tom Stoddard, who wrote Why Gay People Should Seek the Right to Marry. I still assign that to my students. I think it's increasingly difficult for them to connect th to the idea that there might be an internal critique of marriage advocacy. Um, but I think uh, Paula really, in her contribution, really captured sentiments that animated a lot of people for a long time. And we miss Paula. We miss Paula today. Um, I wish you were here with us uh, to, to join the conversation. Um, you know, what happened to that internal debate, I think, is it was overtaken by the dynamics of the public debate. And the dynamics of the public debate, I think, over time became something of a kind of a cultural moment of truth, an epic showdown between the forces opposed um, to same-sex marriage and the, the forces for it, those who passionately oppose gay rights and those who passionately believe uh, in gay rights. The image in my mind is a poker game, and everybody's putting all their chips in the middle. And this is the, this is the battle on which all things stand or fall. Now, I don't think that's correct, necessarily, or inevitable. 
But I think it came to be characterized as this kind of an important showdown. And the effect of that, I think, on the internal LGBT debate about same-sex marriage is it became hard to be a dissenting voice when the lines had been so clearly drawn. It didn't totally drown out that discourse. Uh, we have people today uh, at the conference who I think will talk about that. We'll have a panel uh, uh, tomorrow. Um, uh, I think maybe Marianne Case might have something to say about that at some point in the day. Um, so um, it's not gone, but it's, 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 it's very much been muted. Um, so back to the shot heard around the world, the Hawaii Supreme Court decision in 1993 um, inaugurated the contemporary debate. And I think, of, I think that it makes sense to think of the unfolding of this debate really in three, as three decades. The first decade was from May 1993 when the Hawaii Supreme Court ruled until uh, uh, May 2003. The second uh, is from June 2003, when the US Supreme Court decided Lawrence. Uh, and in the fall of 2003, the, the Massachusetts Supreme Court became the first state Supreme Court in the country to, um, to rule in favor of a right to marry. And that state became the first to marry same-sex couples. Until June of uh, 2013, we had a couple of Supreme Court cases that you might have heard about uh, at the end of last term. And we're obviously going to talk a lot about Windsor and Perry. And then I think that the next decade is unfolding now. And you know, we have some clues about where it's going. We have some clues about the dynamics. I think are going to be very different from what we've seen. But it makes sense to me to break it down that way. And if we break it down that way, the first decade was mostly a decade of backlash. Right, because for all the headlines that the Hawaii Supreme Court got, Hawaii Supreme Court, you know, on the precipice of legalizing same-sex marriage, it never actually got there. It was uh, uh, it was blunted by a, a constitutional amendment in that state, state constitutional amendment. Uh, the, the state Supreme Court had said that the, the Equal Rights Amendment in the Hawaii Constitution required the application of the of uh, the least forgiving form of scrutiny for the state's policy, which made it likely that it would, it would get uh, overturned. And you know, periodically in this debate, by the way, there have been arguments that uh, the ban on same-sex marriage is better seen as a matter of sex discrimination than sexual orientation discrimination. We'll hear uh, this afternoon some reflections on why that hasn't quite taken hold. Um, and. Um, so Hawaii didn't go on to legalize marriage. What did happen was um, massive backlash in the form of the enactment of the Defense of Marriage Act in 96, starting in 1995 with Utah. The state started passing so-called mini uh, domas. And uh, at some point, 40 states got into the act. And so there was a, you know, a, an unfolding policy backlash reflected in state and federal legislation opposed uh, to same-sex marriage. There were, there were a couple of things that happened um, during that time period that weren't uh, quite so bleak for proponents of same-sex marriage. Um, uh, uh, one is, of course, the, the, the Romer decision by the Supreme Court, uh, which applied uh, equal protection to a, an anti-gay rights initiative in, in Colorado to, to strike it down. And, and that was a, a, an important watershed decision, still provides the basis for legal argumentation. Uh, about the constitutionality of bans on same-sex marriage and still a debate about exactly what that case means. Um, in 1999, the Vermont Supreme Court turned back a uh, claim for marriage equality in that state, but said that the legislature had to provide equivalent benefits, whatever they might call it. They called it civil union. That made its way into our uh, vocabulary at that point. And that, at the, at, at the time, I remember, was quite a big deal. In fact, it produced its own backlash in Vermont with people losing their legislative seats uh, for supporting civil unions. Um, now, the second decade uh, is June 2003 to uh, uh, June uh, 2013. This is a very different picture in many ways. It starts off with a dramatic victory in the US Supreme Court in Lawrence. And we have with us Suzanne Goldberg, who was part of both Romer uh, and Lawrence uh, litigation, and, and maybe we'll uh, reflect on that at some point uh, during these two days. Um, the bigger event, obviously, for marriage equality in particular was the Goodridge decision in uh, November of 2003. 
Uh, and starting in the spring of 04, Massachusetts became the first state to allow same-sex couples to marry. Now, there was another, uh, another wave of backlash. Uh, it was a big issue in the 2004 election. There were debates about whether um, the 13 or so anti-same-sex marriage constitutional amendments on the state ballots, which were put there to block a Goodridge-style ruling in those states, so these many states were going back to the well a second time. They'd already passed a statute. It was so much fun that time. Let's pass a constitutional amendment, right? And um, so um, there were debates about whether, because the 2004 election came down to Ohio, whether the increased conservative turnout based on the anti-same-sex marriage movement did or did not turn the election. I don't think that claim has been proven, but there was a debate about it. And it kind of got out there into the popular discourse that same-sex marriage was responsible for the re-election of a president who had, um, uh, who had offered uh, support during the campaign for a federal constitutional amendment against marriage. Um, uh, uh, also in this uh, second decade, Mayor Newsom started marrying people uh, in uh, San Francisco. You may recall that. Uh, it was uh, controversial, uh, to say the least. That started the chain of events that ended up with Prop 8 and Perry, right, because Newsom starts marrying people. There is a challenge to the legality of those marriages. They're declared illegal. Um, uh, uh, but the court includes some language saying, well, nobody's really asked us in the context of litigation whether there's a, a state constitutional right to marry. The lawsuits are filed. They win in the California Supreme Court in 2008. And then Proposition uh, 8 uh, reverses that in November of 2008. Um, the picture, though, in the second decade began to get much more mixed, uh, with not only other state courts, California, uh, Iowa, ruling in favor of same-sex marriage, but as of 2009, state legislatures getting into the act. That seems like a, a sign. The political scientists will tell us uh, that seems like a significant uh, inflection point, um, and of course, leading to the four-state sweep in the 2012 election, which I think, uh, as we were talking about last night, exceeded most uh, expectations and to the historic decisions uh, in Windsor, which struck down um, uh, Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act. And we're very proud here at Stanford that Pam Carlin and her talented students in the Supreme Court Clinic um, wrote the brief on the very complex jurisdictional issues in that case, which could have caused the case to come out uh, very differently. Um, uh, and of course, the Perry case, which um, ruled that the proponents of Prop 8 did not have standing. Therefore, the Supreme Court did not issue its own definitive ruling on the constitutionality of uh, state laws denying uh, same-sex couples access to marriage, but had the effect of reinstating the trial judge's uh, uh, ruling. It looked for a while like there was going to be extended litigation over whether that ruling properly had statewide scope. And there were some efforts at that, but it got overtaken, really, by the political events, I think, is the only way to think about that, as, um, uh, as people started marrying and have uh, married in large numbers uh, in California since then. So we now begin the third decade. It's off to a fast start, as we're up to 13 states uh, and the District of Columbia with marriage equality, uh, with Minnesota, Rhode Island, Delaware uh, recently joining others. Another six states with broad civil union or domestic uh, partnership protection and litigation in many other states. In fact, just yesterday, this is an issue that you can't really read the news for a day. You're unlikely to find nothing about same-sex marriage in a day's news. So yesterday's news what there, uh, is that there, a trial judge in New Jersey struck down that state's um, the relegating couples to civil unions said, no, you've got to give people full marriage equality. Uh, and what the judge said yesterday is that she was not going to stay her ruling for more than two weeks. So um, uh, in two weeks, she said, couples will begin to get married in New Jersey. There'll be an appeal. They'll sort that out. Um, but you know, things are happening all the time. Um, I think maybe the bigger development is it's not only states like New Jersey or Illinois or states that you might predict there would be lawsuits now in the wake of some of the language in Windsor, uh, which we'll talk about what Windsor means um, on the panel tomorrow, and sort through some of the language which seems to be about federalism, which would suggest not broad implications for, for um, uh, state bans on same-sex marriage, 
a lot of language about equal protection and dignity and respect for couples, which seems very consistent with, you know, so uh, who knows where that will all go and what was intended by that. Um, but there are now lawsuits all over the country. And um, we heard a little bit about this last night. That's um, so Texas, Utah, Mississippi, Kentucky. These are not the states uh, that would be predictable venues for the next round of litigation. And I think there's a, there's, a, there's a larger lesson in that, which is that this is no, if this ever was a kind of centralized, planned sequence of we'll go here first, and then we'll go here, and, we'll, and that's, how, that's how it played out in the beginning, right? Uh, state Supreme Courts were chosen with favorable constitutional traditions and favorable makeups on the bench favorable institutional conditions in terms of not the easiest recourse to direct democracy. And it was kind of planned that way. Um, the days of central planning, if it ever existed, are now gone. Um, we had a big, we had a big uh, face off about central planning with the, the filing of the Prop 8 case in federal court, right? We heard, and we'll hear a lot more about that tonight uh, in the plenary. Um, Chad Griffin, um, formerly uh, uh, of the um, uh, foundation which, which uh, uh, got uh, the famous uh, team of uh, Ted and David together and, and brought that lawsuit and, and was, uh, uh, was uh, in uh, spirited dialogue with uh, some, um, some gay rights organizations about whether that lawsuit was a good idea, right? Um, that, was, that was an example of, yeah, there's no centralized planning, but now there's really no centralized planning. And there's a bit of a race to the courthouse. Who is going to get to the Supreme Court? Which of these cases are going to get there first? When is the Supreme Court going to be ready to look at this issue again? Right? There's a lot of kind of, uh, I think, anticipation and strategizing and efforts on the part of various lawyers and clients to make theirs the case that gets there. The Ninth Circuit, in case they're feeling lonely because they don't get a lot of attention for the Prop 8 case anymore, has two cases coming to it from Nevada and from Hawaii. These will not have any standing problems because the uh, Same-sex couples that filed the lawsuit lost below. They'll clearly have appellate standing where the ballot proponents of Prop 8 were found not to have that standing. So we'll hear more from the uh, Ninth Circuit soon. So that's a kind of a very uh, a brief sketch uh, of the legal picture. I just want to say something um, quickly about what we might say about same-sex marriage, the debate, and constitutional law. Because I would argue that the marriage issue has either supplanted Roe or at least joined it as a real focal point for kind of classic questions about constitutional law. Um, you know, when is a court uh, justified in trumping the will of the majority? Uh, which groups are sufficiently disadvantaged, a la John Hardieli and Caroline Products footnote four, to merit special constitutional protections? Can or should courts bring about significant social change? Or is the kind of skepticism that is based on judicial action, uh, or is the kind of skepticism um, reflected by Gerald Rosenberg in his book, Hollow Hope, um, a better way to think about courts that is as severely constrained in what they can do? And interestingly, Rosenberg's book has become kind of a classic. Uh, and his, the first edition of his book focused mostly on race and some on abortion. But he published a second edition of the book specifically to, in 2008, specifically to add the same-sex marriage debate and say, see, it still doesn't work. And because that was in the second decade. That was in the first part of the second decade when mostly there was backlash. Um, but I think developments have overtaken um, uh, Professor Rosenberg. But you know, really, I think what that's a way of saying is the timing matters deeply. Right, there's a, how, when we ask the question, if you would ask the question, um, you know, in the first decade, you would say, wow, mostly the Hawaii ruling has produced a lot of backlash and an ugly map for proponents of um, LGBT equality. Um, now, if you ask the question now, it looks very different, right, 20 years later. And I think there's, there's a couple things that are significant to say about that. One is that um, the backlash reflected in the Defense of Marriage Act and all these um, uh, state constitutional amendments was never really paralleled by a public opinion backlash. That is, there might have been blips of public opinion backlash. But my reading of the evidence is that 
Slowly, over time, public opinion support was rising even while the backlash was unfolding. So the earliest poll I could find on um, attitudes about same-sex marriage was uh, the general social survey um, uh, 1988 or 89, and it showed about 11% national support for same-sex marriage, pretty anemic numbers. Um, by the mid to th uh, middle of that, that, by about 2004, 2005, it's up in the 30 percent. It's, you know, maybe in the 20s and some, 30s and others. And now in most polls, you'll see at least a bare majority and a very strong majority if you ask about both civil unions and same-sex marriage. I mean, just sea change in public opinion. So it's interesting to notice that when we think about backlash, we have to disaggregate a little bit and separate public opinion backlash from policy backlash. The policy backlash lives on in the 30-some states that still have anti-same-sex marriage amendments. Public opinion is moving in a very different direction. What is the role of courts in this? Well, I think the same-sex marriage debate kind of defies any attempt to draw a nice clean arrow from point A to point B and say courts have been a positive influence for supporters of gay rights or uh, courts have been a negative influence. The fact is that courts never act in a vacuum, right? They act and then people react. And that's exactly what happened here, where you had a fully mobilized gay rights movement and opposition to gay rights. So when Hawaii was decided, it didn't take long to get into that bloodstream. People were already mobilized, organized, and I think that's why the debate got nationalized so quickly. And there was this, you know, chain reaction, if you will, of uh, anti-marriage measures. And so at the same time, the court is acting, the political process is acting, and cultural. Uh, uh, manifestations of the debate are, uh, uh, are making themselves uh, felt with, um, you know, uh, depictions of, of same-sex weddings and um, uh, Hollywood stars uh, supporting and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot going on that makes it hard to say. I will say this about courts, though. I think there might be agreement in this room. Maybe someone will disagree with me. In 1993, when the Hawaii Supreme Court acted, there was really no real chance that any state legislature was going to move on marriage equality. It was just perceived to be years off. It was not on the screen. And what the Hawaii court did was they put it on the screen, you know, for good or for ill. And for a while, people were really debating that. Now, 20 years on, it's like, oh, that was a good thing. Didn't always seem that way. Um, but they did get the debate started at a time where I think it would not otherwise have gotten started. And then you know, all bets are off after that with things moving in different directions. I think we could say now that a lot more has moved to the political process. As we see from all these lawsuits, it's not out of court, but there's more going on in the political process, and I think that raises really interesting questions that we'll be talking about tomorrow about uh, the conflict between religious liberty and um, gay rights and the idea of religious exemptions and how that's all going to play out, and, and we've, got some, um, uh, we've got some experts here to, to talk, talk to us about that. Um, last thing I want to say is, you know, one of the issues, and this kind of captivated the Supreme Court in the, in the Windsor and uh, Perry cases, is what level of equal protection scrutiny should be applied to sexual orientation-based discrimination. And I think we've seen that the court seems to have, you know, long since gone out of the business of adding anybody to heightened scrutiny. Maybe they have, maybe they haven't. Um, but they seem to be um, playing around with uh, flavors of rational basis, heightened versus ordinary, rather than going full, full tilt, um, heightened scrutiny. Um, one of the conventional elements in determining whether scrutiny should be heightened has always been whether a group has sufficient political power to protect itself in the political process. And we're going to hear from political scientists um, uh, on that. I'm, I'm eager to hear what they have to say. Um, I think in my own work on that, that we really see how thin the legal idea of enough political power to protect themselves is. It's really, we're looking for a baseline, we're looking for criteria, we're looking for some meat on the bones of that, and it's not really there. Um, so we could, that's one thing to be said. The other thing I, I think is important to say is now, you know, I speak about LGBT, but when we think about that umbrella, I think when you think about political power, there's a big difference between the LGs and the Bs on the one hand and the Ts on the other hand. 
And um, that's something that's going to have to be reckoned with. And we're going to hear uh, a little bit about implications of the marriage debate for transgender issues. And I'm uh, looking forward to hearing that um, as well. Um, so with that, um, that's all I have to say. If anybody wants to make any comments or ask me any questions, we have a few minutes before our break is scheduled. But we can also um, go uh, caffeinate ourselves if, uh, <laughs> if no one has, has anything. Anybody want to jump in? What did I forget? What should I have put in that picture? Derek. So, oh, you need to go to the microphone. I've been told to say that. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you must immediately go to the microphone. Uh, so. I'm a fan of Rosenberg's The Hollow Hope. I've used the book in class. And you, you suggested that events have overtaken yeah. the point he tried to make. But is it fair to say that the courts have produced the social change, or are they really just reacting to it? I mean, yeah. could you imagine the decisions that we've, we've received in the Ninth, uh, in the First and Second Circuits, and, and certainly in SCOTUS, without the, the social bases yeah. to support those things? Oh, I absolutely agree with you. Um, the, the United States Supreme Court, notice how late they, they're getting into the act, right? I mean, they're at the tail end of my second decade. They're at the very end of my second decade. So a lot has happened. Public opinion support has stabilized. What I think is interesting is that there were courts like the Massachusetts court. And one of the, the interesting things about this debate is that most of the activity until now has been in state courts. It was state courts that really took the early action. Um, and um, you know, some of those courts, uh, some of the justices have paid a price for that, as in the uh, Iowa Supreme Court retention election, where several justices lost their seat. Um, I think there is something to that. I think what, where I find fault with Rosenberg is that he's kind of asking the wrong question. It's not can courts produce social change, or are courts too constrained? It's let's try to figure out how courts interact with these other processes. Because I think they ignited something here that wouldn't have otherwise been ignited. And there were strategic interventions of different decisions along the way. I think it would be hopelessly naive to say they did it autonomously, but also wrong to say they didn't have a role in pushing things along. That was great. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Part of what I was thinking, especially when you were talking about the early years, uh, was the stuff that preceded marriage in terms of family recognition, yeah. uh, both in the courts and outside of the courts. And, and as everybody knows, I, I, can't, I think it may have come up a little bit last night, or maybe you and I were just talking about <laughs> right. it. But the sort of early years of going kind of door to door uh, to try to get companies and local governments right. and with state of Wisconsin to yes. adopt domestic partner benefits right. and or provide some sort of recognition for domestic partners. And I think when I think back, because I did some of that door-to-door -door stuff, yeah. um, the, uh, the, the thing that was striking about it, and, and I think it, it's paralleled in the marriage cases somewhat, is that some of the work really came from uh, activists, um, gay and lesbian employees in those companies and in those for the, of those governments who were pushing for this. And sometimes it was just some outlier person who thought, who had no vested interest, who thought this is the right thing to do. Yeah. And it always struck me, I don't actually know the details of how the Hawaii yeah. Supreme Court reached its decision not to dismiss the marriage case there. But I think yeah. in addition to these ideas that there's this interaction between social movements yeah. and the courts and the political sphere, it's just there are some outlier people who, yeah. for whom this is part of their sense of justice. And I guess right. the related set of, sort of a related um, set of cases that I wanted to point out is there were a number of cases seeking family recognition that preceded yes. marriage. And it turned out that the one, like in housing succession and certainly in, in uh, family law parenting <coughs> cases, but I remember back in those days in the early 90s, and we used to talk about how the people, the litigants who won in those cases were typically litigants whose partner had died. And so it was sort of a post 
relationship effort to or post living relationship effort yeah. to seek family recognition and so it was kind of striking to me that the case that that yeah. ultimately invalidates doma is likewise one of those where the members of the couple uh, are no longer together in that sense. And in the in earlier times, certainly the Brashi case, which yes. I know you teach, and yes. it was a housing succession case uh, in New York City, and the court was able to fold a uh, gay a couple of gay men into the into um, the definition of family for purposes of housing succession. Yeah. We used to talk about it as that, that case could work because they weren't going to have sex anymore, right? The court didn't have to imagine what this couple would look like, and so it did, so it was. You know, I, I don't need to spell out. The <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, those are great questions. I mean, part of it really goes back to the theme of when you look at these things, right? Because when I first started teaching, domestic partnership was a big deal. It, it, there weren't a lot of places offering domestic partnership. It was, um, it was not um, seen as um, scraps off the table uh, in the way maybe that it's come to be now. Um, I always joke that in the uh, city of Madison, where I used to live, they had a, uh, I used to teach at the University of Wisconsin, they had a, a domestic, one of the early domestic partnership um, ordinances, but there was absolutely no benefits, rights, or responsibilities attached to it, except you could get a family membership to the Y. That was it. So <laughs> there were not hordes of people lining up to, but we were, you know, you're always trying to get people to sign up. We have, we have to communicate that this is important. It was really a different time, and there were all of those other kinds of family recognition cases, which I think did a lot of the work. I think that the parenting cases actually I mean, it's very interesting, the idea of the, the partner. The partners, either one has died or they're no longer together, it makes it possible for the court to avoid what it doesn't want to think about. Um, but I think a lot of those parenting cases were interesting. Because something else that was going on in, during that backlash first decade is that around the country, 20 or more states were recognizing um, so-called second parent adoption, where you know one partner in a same-sex couple is either the biological or the legal parent of the child, and the uh, non-biological or non-legal uh, parent who sought to be a parent um, was granted rights to adopt. And I always wondered why there wasn't a backlash to that, the way there was a backlash to marriage. Because a lot of the arguments against same-sex marriage are premised on certain claims about children. And that's you know, been a part of the debate. Here, this is precisely about children. And moreover, once those adoptive rights were granted, in a state like Massachusetts, when Massachusetts decides Goodrich, it says, well, we, we can't really use your parenting uh, critique as, as the basis for denying marital rights, because adoption is allowed in the state. So there's an interaction between these things. Um, I have some ideas about why maybe the adoption never took off. One thing is it was a lot less visible. It was never nearly as political, politically salient as marriage. And it didn't kind of capture as neatly and concisely the kind of that packed, dense social meaning of marriage, which is what kind of made it this, this showdown question. The thing I used to teach was, um, and now we would laugh at it, but there was a case in the I think we've finally taken it out of the casebook. But there was a case in the, or maybe it's there as a relic, uh, in the early Rubenstein materials, which was about one partner in New York adopting, trying to adopt his partner as a way to secure some kind of familial rights. And students always like, oh, yuck, that's so yucky. And it's like, well, there, were, there weren't a lot of other you know, things around. So you, you sort of look for protection where you can find it. But it was a, a, a very different um, era. And it's just so interesting how the kind of uh, political meaning and understanding, and we're going to hear um, about that uh, from our very last panel. Doug uh, Nijam is going to talk about the history of some domestic uh, partnership advocacy and its relationship to marriage. And uh, uh, Melissa Murray is going to talk some about the changing understanding of alternatives to marriage uh, on our last panel um, tomorrow. I'm going to ask you another question. Oh, OK. Because it, it actually gets to this question of, uh, of the opposition to marriage equality um, wanting, sometimes wanting to and sometimes failing to put up the sort of Great Wall of China sort of absolutist resistance. So you just made a, an observation 
that the presence of adopted children in a state is then used as a wedge to, in court, to seek uh, marriage equality. Another example, of course, is that a state's granting of, of enhanced civil unions with all the rights of marriage except the word marriage right. can then be used to as evidence that the state is engaged in an irrational right. uh, form of bias by just denying the word. So, so it, it would suggest then to that that opponents would want to put up an absolutist yeah. opposition. Right. So yeah. I wonder if you want to comment. Yeah, I was once um, on a panel, and it was probably God, it was a long time ago. It was uh, it was in that first decade, sometime. Um, no, it was actually the beginning of the second decade, yeah. Because uh, I was already I was already at Stanford, so it was probably like 05 or 06. And I was on a panel with John Eastman, who is you know associated with uh, 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 opposition to same-sex marriage and, and legal efforts in that regard. And we were talking about this on the panel. And he said, you know, for a while, we, talking about his movement, felt like as a matter of compassion, we should um, you know allow not oppose adoptions going forward. But now we see what, what's happening in this litigation, we have to rethink it. I think by that point it was maybe too late to rethink it, um, but it is a really interesting, a really interesting question. Um, sort of related to this, my reading at least of the status of LGBT rights in Europe is that while marriage is pretty ubiquitous, um, the right to adopt yeah. is uh, strongly yeah. Uh, not uh, is, is the battleground, yeah. and I'm wondering if you have some thoughts about whether it's about the the structure of the legal system or the structure of the psyche yeah. of Europeans yeah. and and this country that the that the issues are flipped. That's a great question. I uh, don't have a lot of knowledge about that. Maybe uh, Doug or Marianne, somebody might uh, offer something on that because I don't know a lot about it. Yeah, so I'm, this is something I have thought about a great deal and talked with other people who have thought about it a great deal. Um, I think one standard explanation is that there is across the board, uh, not only in European legal systems, but in European <coughs> culture, um, a much more biologistic understanding of parenthood. which go, So adoption is, uh, as a matter of social fact, very prevalent in the United States, much rarer in Europe, where nations still have, uh, you know, so it's you get citizenship through the blood. Uh, nations are uh, somewhat ethnically homogeneous, uh, and every and this has ripple effects on everything else. So, for example, uh, questioning of adulterous parentage uh, is much easier, uh, and in the U.S. in a lot of states, if uh, someone has held himself out as the father, even if he turns out not biologically to be the father, he stays the father for all purposes. Um, the new reproductive technologies, again, it's overdetermined because there's the Catholic Church, but uh, you know, so uh, whether sperm donors have to make themselves, can, can be anonymous. So just a biologistic notion of parenting. And then on the other hand, uh, Europe has a, a band, you know, Bill, Bill Eskrich has, can, has written uh, about this, but uh, Europe abandoned marriage long before same-sex marriage came in and had alternate forms of partnership recognition that began with heterosexual couples. Um, so in the Netherlands, you started with unregistered domestic partnership, then you had registered domestic partnership for both sexes, and then same-sex marriage. Yeah. That's interesting. Thank you very much. All right, I think we should take our break so that we can get our first panel started on time. Thank you all.